we talk about live encoding and transcoding techniques. And here's our agenda. I want to cover some high level workflows. And then I'm going to, you know, when I talked about this three or four years ago, basically it was like choose an encoding tool because, you know, you had very few choices when it came to architecting this or um, how you would deliver the streams. You know, you sent your one stream to a streaming server, which sent that out, and, and that was it. So basically, it was choosing a capture tool. And now that the workflows have expanded so much that you really have to, A, understand what workflows are out there, B, choose a service provider and, and out of a category of service providers. And then once you choose a service provider, then you have to choose a capture device that delivers the stream necessary to work with that service provider. So I kind of want to spend some time exploring all that. And then um, we'll, we'll look at who the providers are, what they do. We'll look at user personas, you know, who should use what kind of service provider. And we can discuss that because none of this is black and white. And then as a last phase, we'll say, OK, now that you know which service provider you need and what streams you need to provide that provider, then you can choose an encoder. And so that's kind of where we'll end up. But I, you know, where do we want to get to? My assumption is that we're going to want to get to at least two groups of adaptive streams. And you know, if you're doing this today, it, it could be a flash set of streams and an HLS set of streams. If you're doing this in 12 months, it could be dash and HLS. But you want two sets of adaptive bitrate streams so you get ABR video to your different target markets. And let me, let me say that you know, this, this uh, presentation will be up on the streaming media site within you know, probably a couple of days. It will be up on my site, which is the Streaming Learning Center, um, by the end of the day. So if you Google Janos or Streaming Learning Center, you'll be able to see all the presentations from, uh, from the last few hours. OK, so this is where we want to get to. We want to get to two groups of adaptive bit rates, one for desktop, one for mobile. Now, how can we get there? So five years ago, you had to buy a $36,000 encoder that produced all the streams necessary at the point of origin and sent those out to the streaming server. That was, that was your only option. Still is an option, still is something you may want to do if you're a broadcaster, you may want to do in certain circumstances, but there are a couple of other <coughs> options that you have. And this is a situation where you're creating your three files with an encoder, and this is a software encoder, Telstream Wirecast. You're sending those three files into the cloud, and there are a number of services and a number of products that can do this for you, but they can transmux the streams. So maybe you send RTMP streams in, and RTMP streams are streams that play on a flash device, and then the service service provider or product that's there in the middle transmuxes that or change the container format from RTMP to HLS. So transmuxing is, you know, you're not doing any re-encoding. All you're doing is changing the container format so it, it plays on another device. And transmuxing is a very fundamental concept of what we're going to talk about today. And any questions on transmuxing? Is that, you know, what we're doing is we're sending one stream in here, or three files in here in one format, RTMP, um, and then the transmuxing services in here are going to convert that to HLS. It's a very lightweight operation because they're not re-encoding. They're not doing anything other than changing the container format and chunking up the file. So it's happening in real time. There's no latency. Go ahead. When you say efficiency, do you mean latency? Do you mean, do you mean how many services it take to do it? Or I mean, it, it, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. And you know, what, what I'm hearing from Wowza is that the conversion process is so fast that when they do it for on-demand, it, it, it takes longer to retrieve the file from disk than it does to actually perform the, the transmuxing. So it's a very lightweight operation. You can do it in real time. We also heard from Akamai yesterday that they're moving away from this for very complicated files, but you can't move away from it for, for live. This is your only option, right? You can't.
prepackaged live event. So it, according to Wowzer, you can support a whole lot of streams um, very efficiently on one, you know, one uh, uh, cloud device. And they have statistics on their website that tell you um, how many streams they can support. So this is option number two, is you create the streams on the desktop and you transmux into the formats that you need. And the third way to get there is you send one file in from your encoder, and this is a Teradek on-camera encoder. You're sending one file in, and then you're creating three streams from, th from that file. So in this case, you're not transmuxing. You're technically transrating because it's H.264 to H.264. So this is a more CPU-intensive operation um, called on the cloud, or, or it's cloud transcoding. And services like YouTube, services like Brightcove, pretty much every top-end streaming service today is doing cloud transcoding and transmuxing to the, to the different formats. OK, so option one, use the big iron encoder to create all the files you need at your storage, you know, at your, at your event location. Option two, create three files or how many files in your adoptive group at that location. And transmux in the cloud. Option three, send one file up to the cloud and let the cloud do the transcode into the separate streams and the transmux into the different formats. Okay, so everybody clear on those are our three high-level options in terms of how we get to the files that we want to get to, which again are the, the, the adaptive group for desktop and the adaptive group for mobile. So as I said at the top, that gives us two choices. What service do we want to use to help us get there? And then once we know what service we're going to use, which encoder do we use to feed the file or files to the service provider? So in, in, in before we start discussing the various service providers, I wanted to talk about what's involved in a live event. Because we're going to look at six classes or five classes of service providers, and they're going to they're going to offer a different feature set as to what they do for you in your live event workflow. And this is, you know, you guys know all this, you're producing your events, but I just kind of wanted to talk about these real quickly so we, we, uh, we were on the same page. So on-site production, you know, this is all those guys in the back, they're doing the shooting, um, you know, they're doing the, the streaming, they're, they're manning the encoder, some operations have a director, some have producers. So, Somebody's got to do this. Even if it's just pointing a camera, somebody's got to do it. More elaborate events, this is a bigger deal. You need somebody doing on-site encoding. You know, again, whether that's just a switch in Wirecast or whether it's an elemental live server, you need somebody performing this function. Somebody's got to get the signal to the server. Um, usually not satellite, but it's a cool picture. Um, but you know, it, it could be satellite, it could be Ethernet, it could be, it could be uh, any number of different ways to get there, but somebody's in charge of doing this. And, you know, for this event, plugging into the, you know, plugging into the, the uh, hotel's Wi-Fi or Ethernet might be sufficient. If you're broadcasting the Olympics and you need redundancy and you need format redundancy, you, you can't use two satellites, you need to use satellite and fiber, all of a sudden that's a big deal and you need somebody who knows how to do that to get that done for you. And then you need the transcode and packaging. So this is where we, you know, we've got the one file in. We create the multiple bit rate um, assets here, and then we package to the formats. We kind of covered that at the start. And then the streaming server needs to be there to make the stream available to the different users. They've got to have a URL where they can access and, and supply those files. Um, you've got somebody to create the player for you, right? So can't play video without a player. You've got to deliver the streams. You know, sometimes that's easy, sometimes that involves a, you know, a global uh, CDN like Akamai. And then you've got the support functions. You know, if something breaks, whether it's a service provider or hardware or something, you need somebody to call. Maybe they're on site if it's a big enough event, maybe they're just, you know, available on the phone. But all these functions are a component of your overall live event workflow. And then when you're evaluating service providers, you've got to look at a bunch of features. You know, what output formats do they support? What's the highest resolution they support? Can they get you advertising? Can they protect your video with, our, with DRM? Do they supply captions? In what formats do they supply captions? And, 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 you know, what are the features of the video in terms of a resolution perspective? And all this is leading to this slide here. And 
Again, this will be available for download. Um, and I'm going to have each one of these columns broken out in different slides here. So we're going to be getting to that, you know, something that's a little bit easier to see. But I wanted to kind of break down the different classes of products and services you could consider to deploy if you don't want to do everything yourself. So here's do-it-yourself transcoding. And the basic theory there is, you know, you drive, we supply the technology. So this is somebody like the Wowza Media Server or FFmpeg or some components of um, Microsoft Azure where all they're doing is, you know, supplying a, a lump of technology that you can use for a specific function. Maybe it's transcoding, maybe it's transmuxing, but you're in charge of pretty much everything else. You're in charge of signal acquisition, you're in charge of on-site encoding, you're in charge of production, you're in charge of delivery, you're in charge of distribution, you're in charge of player development. So that's the, the do-it-all-yourself except for this one technology component. At the other end of the spectrum, we have live streaming service providers like YouTube or um, Livestream or Ustream, who's one of our sponsors, where they do everything. You just get the signal to them and they do the rest. And Ustream will even send out a production crew if you want them to produce the, the event for you. Um, so they can, they can do the entire thing from soup to nuts. And, and in between, there are some interesting, you know, different points. So you can go to an encoding provider like Zencoder or Bitmoving or Microsoft Azure again or Wowza Cloud or Elemental Cloud, and they can do the transcoding and packaging for you, but that's it. You still do everything else. You can go to, and this is kind of an interesting category. This is iStream Planet, and there's somebody here from iStream Planet um, if we have any questions, but the, you know, they specialize, I think, they're one of these companies that you think you know what they do, but you're, you're not 100% sure, but they do a lot of big events that are kind of very hard to do. They're, you know, the, the, the Olympics, you know, the events where you, you, know, the, where you need multiple forms of, of uh, acquisition. You need to get the signal there with, with, with redundancy. You need to do, everything's got to be high quality, everything's got to be um, foolproof. And networks don't have experience in doing this. They know how to do their shows or their games from the regular stadiums. But if it's a really big event, you call iStream Planet. And, and they do a certain percentage of these things. But again, they don't do the whole thing. They're not going to create the player for you. Um, and I guess I didn't change DRM. But they, they do some of this stuff, a lot of hand-holding, a, you know, a lot of big event stuff that some people need, but, but this is not a huge category. Then you've got your OVPs with live capabilities. So if you're using Brightcove or Kaltura or Uyala as your, as your OVP for um, on-demand video, and they offer a live service, it's pretty natural that you want to use them for your live streaming because you can use the same player, you can use the same analytics. Everything you're using already, you can use um, with that service provider. So and let me just say that, <clears throat> you know, whenever you put something in a spreadsheet that's yes or no and it's very clean, this world is not that clean. You know, there's a, particularly Azure seems to do a little bit of everything. And, you know, so it's, this is, there's a lot of gray where spreadsheets don't, don't show gray very well. I just wanted to throw that caveat out there. Um, the first category is, again, the uh, do-it-yourself transcoding. We'll supply the technology. You do the rest. And, you know, that's Wowza. Um, it is, is Wowza in, in, in the Wowza streaming engine as opposed to the Wowza cloud. And again, here's the range of stuff that they do and the range of stuff that they don't do. Here's um, encode transcode. This is pretty much the same, except they're going to do more on the encoding side than, than, than Wowza will do for you. Um, companies in this space are Zencoder, Bitmoving, Azure, Wowza Cloud, um, and Elemental Cloud where, again, you're going to do all the production, you're going to do the streaming production, they'll do the encode transcode, um, and then you're in charge of pretty much the rest. Monetization, player creation, delivery, you're going to have to arrange for that. Here's iStream Planet, if we have time at the end and anybody has any questions, I'll let Alex talk about that. Um, again, their specialty is production services, streaming production services, encode, transcode, and packaging, and then also, you know, delivery of the stream, the, you know, the acquisition side. And then here's full service provider soup to nuts. This is who you go to if you want them to handle everything. 
you send them a stream, they deliver the rest. And that's OVPs with live capabilities, we talked about those, and, and we've talked about these providers as well. So then I wanted, to, I wanted to kind of map users to these products and services. So if you are, you know, what kind of person uses which kind of product and service? And in order to do that, the first dichotomy you had to kind of talk about was whether, whether video is a product for you or whether it's a tool. So if you're a Fortune 500 company and you want to have a, you know, video of your president talking about a new strategy, that's not a product, that's a tool. You know, you're not in the business of producing videos, you're using video as a tool in your organization. Very different needs from somebody who's creating a product or a service that's based on video. Um, monetization DRM options and captions, I mean, if you, if you need all that stuff, then you're, you're going to be more limited in the service providers that you can use and how much technical ability you have to use them um, because those are pretty technical requirements. What are the technical capabilities you have on staff? You know, do you have coding? Do you have scripting? Can you develop a player? Can you, you know, can you do the steps necessary to work with some of the infrastructure provider? And then the, the, the buyer personas that I kind of created are the Fortune 500 Corporation for live event web broadcasting, the service provider who's in the business of providing video and just needs some technology to kind of fit in, broadcaster with a large event, meaning a, a broadcaster like NBC, CBS doing the Olympics or you know, obviously that's another point to the uh, iStream Planet people. And then a linear broadcaster. What do you do if you're, you know, if you're broadcasting 24-7 and you're just looking for a cheaper way to do it? Which, which where do you look in the, tech, in, the, uh, in the service provider taxonomy that we talked about? And if you're a Fortune 500 company or you're pretty much any company, you're not in the video business, you're creating a video as a tool for your organization, you're going to want to use somebody on the extreme right. You want to, you know, you're not going to use a WoW as a media server. You're just going to go to Livestream, go to Ustream, go to, go to a full service provider, send them the video stream, and, and let them do all the work. And you're going to pay a little bit higher price for that, but it's going to be easy. You're not in the business. You're, you're not going to be able to get captions. You'll get access protection for DRM, but you won't get true DRM. You will get adaptive streaming. Um, and, and again, your best option is the live streaming service provider or, or OVP. And then here's, you know, your service provider looking for a technology stack. You're looking for, you know, you want to be in the live streaming business in some way. Maybe you're a, uh, a company that does that, or you're, you're, you're producing webinars that you're distributing online live. You're in the business. Um, you know, training is one that comes to mind, other specialty videos. In this case, you're going to go to a, a DIY or an ENCODE transcode. You're just looking for a particular function. You have the technical capabilities to build a player, to communicate with a server, to hire a CDN, do all that stuff for distribution. You're just looking for technology, and you're going to use somebody on the extreme left. The broadcaster with a live event, again, this is, this is the, the kind of the iStream Planet niche where they're helping people do unusual events that they're doing something differently they're not doing every day and they have expertise in large event production all stages of that. And then if you're a linear broadcaster seeking to you know make the move from a big iron encoder to something in the cloud you're going to have technical skills necessary in house to use some of the DIY transcoding or encoding transcoding functions and you're probably seeking the least expensive solution. And one of the, one of the things that, you know, you, you're not going to be looking for a solution on the extreme right. You're going to be looking for a solution on the extreme left. So let me, let me stop there. Any reaction? Any questions? Alex, you got anything? Okay, thank you. Any questions, any comments? Anybody? Is this the after lunch, you know? Do we stand up and do calisthenics? Or? Bad idea. 
Okay, so choosing your encoding tool, you're gonna have you're gonna have a bunch of different factors that you need to consider. It's gonna be the same whether you're looking at a big iron hardware encoder or a software encoder. You know, you're gonna have the how many streams do you need to produce, what are the resolutions and formats, what are the features, DRM, you know, digital rights management, captions, advertising insertion. Where are you going to, you know, where are you gonna pick that up? If you need those, you're gonna do it at the server side, you know, the encoding side when you have a big iron encoder, or are you gonna do it at the service provider level? You need to consider portability requirements. You know, if, if, we're, if we're shooting this, we're fine with almost any encoder, but if you're following somebody with a camera, you probably need an on-camera encoder or an encoder in a camera, like Panasonic and JVC have. Um, size and noise considerations. You know, if you're broadcasting from a conference room, you need a different live encoder than you do for a concert hall. Um, and then we're gonna look at some of the other features that are found in products that also do encoding. Do you need video mixing from a hardware software product? Do you need a streaming server? Do you need lecture capture? You know, do you need to capture a signal, send it out to a school, and mix, you know, mix different uh, feeds in that device? And we'll, we'll see encoding examples for all these scenarios. So this is my, um, this is my mind map. And on the left are kind of the, the categories of hardware encoder. And I tried to identify either prominent companies or companies that are here at the show, or obviously companies that are both. So you know, you'll see examples if, you, if, you're, if you're interested in a lecture capsule solution, it's nice that Epifan is here. You know, if you're looking for on camera, Teradex here. So these are these are the different categories that I'm gonna cover. This is the hardware side, this is the software side. And I'm saying it's a partial list because the, the, the universe of live streaming products today is just huge. I mean, it, it's, it's almost impossible to ca categorize on, on one slide. And if you're, if you're choosing hardware, again, there are some generic considerations you need to, you need to consider before you buy. Obviously, the, the easy one is to, to connect to your inputs. I mean, if you've, if you've got HDSDI out, you need a, an encoder that does HDSDI in, or you need some kind of converter. Um, does it produce the required outputs? And I think HEVC is going to be a big deal. Um, HEVC is the next generation codec after H.264. It's particularly useful in a live environment because you get the same quality signal at a much lower bit rate. And for most live event producers, um, getting the video out of the building is almost always a challenge. You know, I'd always rather have a more compact stream than a, than, than a bigger stream. I think HEVC is one of the big places it's gonna play a role is in the contribution for live encoding and, and, and other type uh, applications. You know, what, what codecs does a live encoder support? What, what codecs do you need it to support? And how many streams can it output? If you need one stream, you just need a pretty simple encoder. If you need nine streams, you're gonna need to spend a lot of money for a big hardware encoder. What features do you need in terms of advertising, insertion, captions, DRM? And then, you know, in differentiating the products, you're gonna, you're gonna hear a lot about best quality encoding. I've never really seen a s substantial difference. They're, they're all gonna say that they're the best at everything, but I think qualitatively they're all pretty similar. There are some density issues. You know, the, you will, some will produce more streams for a similar size, but um, from a quality perspective, I wouldn't see a lot of difference. So the big iron encoders, this is the first category. Um, when do you want to use this? You, you, you use this when you have high volume usage, periodic large events, or, or, or daily broadcasts. When you need to get, um, you know, you're, you're producing all the streams and all the packaging in your facility and you need to get them out of the building. So you'll need a big iron encoder to do that. Or you'll need an, iron, uh, a, an encoder like this to access advanced features like advertising insertion, closed captions, all the ones I've talked about before. And who's at the show? DVEO is at the show, Elemental. Um, most of you people probably had lunch with Elemental uh, just a few minutes ago. They're at the show as well. And the other big iron encoders, um, companies like Atem and Imagine Communications. So these are 
big expensive products and I think these are the products that a lot of broadcasters are kind of moving away from you know because they're thirty six thousand dollars is a pretty big hit and you can do it in the cloud for two hundred bucks an hour um, you know it, it, it may make a whole lot more sense and I, I, I covered this a second ago Okay, a lot of applications, if you just, you know, this is your small portable generic encoder. If you just need to send a single stream to a, to a, to, to, to a Wowza media server or to Ustream, you just need a device that can create a single stream. And there's a couple of those, a couple of those at the show that are pretty, or there's one at the show that's worth looking at, and that's the data video NVS25, and it's, that's a simple box that just does H.264 real-time encode to send to a live streaming service provider or service. Other products that are prominent in the category, the Matrox Monarch, that's this guy over here. Um, the nice thing about the Monarch is it's dual stream. And that gives you the ability to record one stream, you know, a, a 20 megabit per second stream, direct to SD card on the encoder for later editing, and then you can output another stream to, again, Ustream or another live streaming service provider, and they can be different configurations. So if you, want to, if you want to do a 5 megabit per second stream out at 720p and store a 20 megabit per second 1080p stream, you can do that with that product. Um, the focus of the, the Vitek Nano is more ruggedized, no moving parts, very quiet operation, very small. You know, you can use this unit. You could, you could have it right next to somebody and they wouldn't even know it's there. Um, it's also got a lot of high-end metadata for surveillance and military use. So... That's kind of the focus of this product down here. But again, this is, what do you do if you just, you want to use a piece of hardware to get video out of the building into your live stream service provider? And on camera, um, when do you need a device like this? Again, whenever you're moving a camera around, um, very hard to use any other kind of encoder than one that's either in a camera or, um, or on a camera. Teradek, I don't know if they invented the category, but I think they've got the most products and, and really good products. They're here at the show. And this is the Teradek Bond. It's on top of a camera. It can mux together up to, I guess this one does four 4G signals. So you can, you can do Wi-Fi, you can do Ethernet, and you can do 4G with the different modems. And then Panasonic's here at the show. They're showing this PTZ camera and PTZ Optics is here as well, and they're showing this PC, PTZ camera, both of which can send a stream to a live streaming service provider or other RTMP address. Um, probably the best known in-camera encoder is JVC. I think they were the first ones out. A lot of their encoders have a USB port. In the USB port, you can put a 4G modem, and you can broadcast directly from the camera. They also do dual codec, so you have, you know, you can store and transmit different parameters. Okay, if you're using a video switcher that's a hardware switcher, a lot of those devices have the ability to stream from the device. Some, have do, some do it natively, some require um, other components to do it. Here at the show, Data Video has this switcher here. It was just reviewed in Streaming Media Producer. And it's a pretty inexpensive unit, which is nice. I mean, I, I like inexpensive hardware switchers. They're easy to use. They, they're, they're easy on the budget. You'll need this device here, which is a sister product, to stream live. So they come for a streaming solution. They come paired that way. This is a Roland, um, this is a Roland video switcher. They're here at the show as well. And you'll probably need a PC to stream from this device. So what this device does is it outputs a, a stream via USB. You put the USB stream in your computer, you use one of the software encoders we're talking about in a few minutes, and then you can stream to any RTMP or, or even some Windows media servers if, if you need to do that. So that's the Roland option. Sony has a product called the Anycast Touch Live. This is a very, very integrated, very tiny video mixer, pretty high end, pretty cool product. You can hook up an ethernet port to this and send video directly to a live streaming server. And then vMix Go is a, is a combination of the vMix software and a lunch pail computer 
that's a video mixer that can also send a stream out to a live streaming service provider or record a stream. So if you're, using, if you're buying a video mixer, um, you should be able to get one that's got the live streaming capability and it'll get a single stream or even multiple streams out of the building. And then, you know, one specialty category I wanted to talk about is the lecture capture. Um, one option if we were broadcasting this is a product called the Epifan Pearl. You know, it's a two camera, or actually it's four camera, HDSDI or HDMI. You can do picture in picture, you can do live switching, and you can send one stream out to, you know, to a live streaming service provider or any kind of service that's, that's out there. So this is a nice unit because it's touch screen driven. You don't need to bring a computer. Basically, it's all in one contained. You can pre-configure it and send it out with non-technical users as long as they can plug the cameras in and, and push a couple buttons, they can get a live stream up and running. So pretty specialty product, very easy to use, um, and, it, and it's here at the show. On the software encoder, there's three categories we're going to talk about. Um, free, service provider specific, and video production software. <laughs> Here's um, the Adobe Flash Media Live Encoder. Who, who here uses the Adobe Flash Live Media Encoder? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still, I don't think they've updated it, in, but it's still, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, industrial strength. It, get, you know, it produces very, very high quality streams. The one caveat is that the Windows version doesn't include AC3 audio, it does MP3 audio. Um, there is a plugin you can buy from Main Concept, which is $200, that'll give you the AC3, or you can just use it on the Mac, which is what I do, and that the Mac version does have uh, AC3 encoding. <laughs> and then live production, uh, this is the, you know, when do you want to use this? A lot of times if, you're, if you don't want to buy a hardware switcher, you may want to buy a product like um, Telstream Wirecast or vMix software, and then you can do a lot of multiple camera switching on your on your on your computer, and you're going to save, you know, anywhere between. You'd save a lot of money. You can build your own for you know if you have a computer around for under, under a couple of thousand dollars, and the th nice thing about software is like all software, it's very very functional. A lot more features than you would get for a two thousand dollar you know, appliance-based video switcher. If you, if you use either, the Telstream Wirecast is here at the show, vMix is here at the show. If you need, you know, if you're going to use one of these on your computer, you're going to need a computer-based capture device. There's a company called Magewell here at the show, and they do a lot of um, both internal cards and, and products you can attach to your USB port or, your, uh, or other ports to get capture without, you know, on a laptop or without um, opening up your computer. So if you buy a product in this category, you're going to need a capture device to get the video into the computer. Uh, again, the nice thing about these, it's a very inexpensive way to get video production, um, and, and all of them will send out a stream to whichever service provider you, you, uh, you need to send it to. And then the last category is if you're, you know, if, if you decide to use a live streaming service provider like Ustream or YouTube or, or Livestream, most of them are going to have their own version of software encoder. So Livestream has a free version, Ustream has free versions, YouTube Live has a free version of, of Wirecast. So if you're, if you're going to use one of these services, it makes sense to use their software because you're gonna, it's going to be the easiest one to use. Um, And that's it. Any questions? OK, again, this presentation will be up on my site, Streaming Learning Center, <laughs> um, probably in the next hour or so. And it'll be up on the uh, streaming media website in the next, uh, I would guess, the next day or so. OK, that's it. Thanks for coming.